My thesis is simple. I'm going to argue that Mohandas K. Gandhi, also known as Mahatma Gandhi, was the most influential and important political leader and thinker of the 20th century, whose legacy still remains relevant to our time. In the year 1997, I was invited by the University of California at Berkeley to teach a course on Gandhi. Uh, at first, I was hesitant because I had till then worked mostly on the environment. And my friends were even more hesitant. They told me that if I went all across from Bangalore to Berkeley, I would merely have a handful of students in my class, all ABCDs, America-born confused Desis, and more likely ABCD EFGs, America-born confused Desis emigrated from Gujarat. Well, so I was nervous on the first day of the class because in an American university class, unlike an Indian university class, anyone can come and anyone can go. Well, to my surprise and delight, there were nearly 50 people, very few of whom were of Indian origin. In that class, I had an African-American, a Jew, uh, many Caucasians, a Burmese student who had worked with Aung San Suu Kyi in the democracy movement, and that was absolutely the most interesting and exciting course I've ever taught in my career as a teacher in many universities across the world. On my long flight back from Berkeley to Bangalore, I reflected on my experience and I thought, what is it that makes Gandhi travel across continents? What is it that makes him such a universal figure? That Jews, Christians, Muslims, Parsis, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, Argentinians, Poles, Americans are all interested in Gandhi. I wondered if uh, an American uni university professor from Berkeley was to come to my own university, Delhi, and teach a course called Arguments with Roosevelt, would anyone show up? If a Chinese professor went to uh, Buenos Aires and taught at the university there, a course on Arguments with Mao, would anyone come? So what is it that makes Gandhi such an exceptional figure? What is it that makes a man born in one country 150 years ago, still spoken of with interest and appreciation and curiosity in so many different parts of the world. Now, and I'll just give you a few illustrations of the continuing resonance that Gandhi has. Not long after President Obama was elected uh, to his office in 2008, he was asked by a journalist if there was one person who's no longer living, whom you'd like to have dinner with, who would that be? And Obama immediately answered Gandhi. And then he added, of course, it would be a frugal bean. Well, Obama is the leader of the most powerful nation in the world, the commander-in-chief commander of the most powerful army in the world. But flip the coin and look at a small country like Yemen, a struggling country like Yemen, and consider a non-violent struggle on there uh, for greater rights and freedom. It's uh, <coughs> led by a young lawyer called Tawakul Karmal, who is in her early 30s. I believe she's the youngest person to have won the Nobel Peace Prize. And in her study in Yemen, there's a portrait of Gandhi. So that's the extraordinary reach of Gandhi's appeal so long after he was dead. What explains it? And that's what I'm trying to... Uh, I've tried to get to grips, grips with it as a historian and biographer of Gandhi and someone who studied Gandhi all his life. Well, firstly, uh, Gandhi lived a long life uh, and is enjoying a long afterlife. Secondly, he worked in three continents. Born in the Western Indian state of Gujarat, uh, he studied law in London, spent 20 years as an activist uh, and social organizer in South Africa before returning home to India in 1914 at the age of 1945 to nurture and lead a large-scale struggle for national freedom. So he worked in three continents, which is not an experience many of us have. Uh, he had as many as four or five careers. He was a freedom fighter who launched a popular struggle to end British colonialism. He was a social reformer who simultaneously attacked pernicious social practices such as untouchability and worked for the emancipation of women. He was a religious thinker who, though born a Hindu, 
I had close, intimate friendships with people of other faiths, and I wrote a great deal about how being born in one religion must not preclude a deeper understanding of another religion. So that's his third career, that of a religious thinker. And finally, he was a prophet, someone uh, who warned against uh, some of the dangers of excessive materialism and industrialism. And one would argue that he even had a fifth career, that of a writer. Uh, politicians today, and here President Obama may be an exception, all politicians today use ghostwriters. Uh, the collected speeches of David Cameron are not his own. The collected speeches of Manmohan Singh are not his own. They are written by a staff of professional writers. But Gandhi wrote every word himself, and he wrote a great deal. For more than four decades, he edited a newspaper. His collected works run to more than 90 volumes. <coughs> so here is a man who had five careers as a political activist, as a social reformer, uh, as a religious thinker, as a prophet, and as a writer. And in that sense, you may think of him as a colossal figure in his time and in ours. While Gandhi lived, he was known principally as the architect, architect of the freedom for politic, uh, political independence of India. When Gandhi came back to India in 1915, uh, he was uh, r r relatively unknown. He had been an activist in the diaspora, but he really didn't have a presence in his homeland, which is why he spent the first year back in India trying to get to know India. He traveled across the villages for a whole year, and then he was ready to enter the Indian National Congress, which was at that time the most important vehicle of Indian nationalist aspirations. Gandhi entered the Congress and transformed it. Before he entered it, the Congress was a gentleman's debating club centered in the cities. He took it to the countryside. He involved peasants and workers. Uh, he uh, changed the proceedings from those conducted in English uh, to incorporate all the languages of India. And this deepening of the mass base of the Indian national movement was what gave it its strength, its resilience, its power. He was a fantastic organizer. And political parties today nascent political parties today can learn from Gandhi how to mobilize funds, uh, how to create a cadre of devoted activists, uh, how to network, how to uh, deal uh, courteously with your opponents and change them to your point of view. And it's through those methods that Gandhi achieved freedom for India. But his relevance continues even 65 years after Indian freedom. And in my view, Gandhi matters today uh, for four reasons. The first reason is his legacy of non-violent resistance. Before Gandhi, those seeking freedom or emancipation adopted one of two methods. Either they wrote polite, beseeching, beseeching letters to those who were oppressing them, or they took up a gun and launched armed struggle. Gandhi innovated this new method of non-violent collective disobedience. And that's what shamed the British finally into leaving India. And it's this legacy of non-violent resistance to which he gave the term Satyagraha that was adopted later with such conspicuous success by Dr. Martin, Martin Luther King in the United States. It was adopted by activists in the totalitarian regimes of communist Eastern Europe. Solidarity, the major Polish movement, was inspired by Gandhi. Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, who is an extraordinary non-violent activist of today, is also inspired by Gandhi, and as are countless other popular struggles across the world, including the struggle in Yemen, which I mentioned. So that's the first reason Gandhi matters. Gandhi left behind uh, a strategy of collective resistance to unjust laws and authoritarian governments, a strategy that, unlike that of Marxist revolutionaries, did not involve the taking of blood or killing or murdering your opponent. So that's the first uh, fundamental reason why Gandhi is still alive today. The second reason has to do with his religious philosophy. The world today uh, is divided broadly into 
two camps when it comes to matters of faith and religion. On the one side, you have rival religious fundamentalisms, Hindu fundamentalists, Islamic fundamentalists, Christian fundamentalists, Jewish fundamentalists, who shape and determine the politics of this world in rather ugly and often barbaric ways. So that's one direction in which religion goes, that of fundamentalism, demonizing people of other faiths. The other direction is that of a, a equally aggressive atheism, represented by scientists, middle class professionals, who have contempt for anyone who is a person of faith. And Gandhi, as with nonviolence, negotiated a beautiful and compelling middle path. He said, accept the religion you are born into, but do not convert the person of another faith. Start a dialogue. If you're a Hindu, start a dialogue with the Christians, with the Muslims and the Jews, and cultivate interfaith understanding. If you're a Hindu, make your friend who's a Christian a better Christian. And his job is to make you a better Hindu. And by this Gandhi meant, push, uh, interfaith dialogue should push people towards cultivating the compassionate, non-violent, uh, uh, emancipatory aspects of their own religion against the bigoted, fundamentalist, intolerant aspects of their own religion. So as a prophet of interfaith understanding, Gandhi is relevant today in a world riven by religious discord. The third reason Gandhi is, I think, extremely uh, important, uh, and his ideas remain persuasive and speak to us, are in the realm of the environment. In 1928, Gandhi said, God forbid that industrialization, uh, I beg your pardon, Gandhi said in 1928, God forbid that India take to industrialization after the manner of the West. A s the industrialization of a single tiny island kingdom, namely England, has kept the world in chains. If India, a nation then of 300 million, takes to similar economic exploitation, it will strip the world bare like locusts. Well, now India has a billion people, China has more than a billion people. Gandhi was absolutely prophetic. If India and China follow the same resource intensive, capital intensive, pillaging, looting model of industrial development, we will collectively strip the world bare like locusts. Well, Gandhi lived out his environmental philosophy in his own life. He's a man who compulsively recycled everything. He may have welcomed the internet age precisely because he did not use much paper. He's supposed to have said the world has enough for everybody's need, but not enough for one person's greed. And that environmental credo he enacted in his daily life. Finally, uh, Gandhi remains, I think, relevant for the openness and transparency of his life. Gandhi's ashram was accessible to anyone. Anyone could walk in. Uh, you could go, you could debate with him, you could argue with him. Uh, you, he wrote nearly 200 letters a day. Some were uh, letters on matters of great political importance to do with planning the strategy of the national movement. Others were answers to friends, full of suffused with love and affection. And yet others were replies to his critics. Anyone could write to Gandhi attacking his views on caste, on gender, on nonviolence, on religion, and would get an answer. So here was a rare politician who lived his, lived his life in the open. Anyone could go into his ashram, anyone could write to him, anyone could converse with him. And in these respects, he's so fundamentally different from the suspicious, paranoid politicians of today who erect a wall between them and their public. Sometimes it's a... Uh, it's, a, it's an actual wall. It's a, it's a wall made of glass because they all speak from bulletproof compartments. At other times, it's a wall made up of prevarication, of, uh, of ambiguity, of deflection. You nev can never get a straight answer from a politician today. So whether it be his principled advocacy of nonviolent resistance, whether it be his lifelong pursuit of interfaith harmony, whether it be his precocious environmentalism, whether it be the transparency and openness of his life, Gandhi matters. Gandhi speaks to us today. He's invoked uh, 
taken forward in countless debates in very many countries. But I'd like to end with the last reason Gandhi matters. Gandhi matters because he was that rare politician, indeed rare human being, who had a sense of humor. Uh, and it was spontaneous. And I'll, maybe I'll give you three examples. The first example has to do with uh, <coughs> his visit to England in 1931 to negotiate terms for Indian independence in what was called the Round Table Conference. So he goes to England, and he's granted an audience with the King Emperor, and he goes dressed in a loincloth. Uh, and of course, the King was wearing an impressive suit. And it was a cold day. It was December in London. And when he comes out of the meeting, and he's asked by a reporter, didn't you feel cold? He said, the King had enough for two of us. So that's one example of his humor. The second example uh, is perhaps his most famous statement, which also comes from that trip to England, where as he gets off the boat, this foe of the British Empire is asked by an English journalist, what do you think of Western civilization? And he answers, I think it would be a good idea. Now, a friend of mine adds a postscript to that, where he says, if Gandhi was to come back to his homeland today, and if we were to ask him, what do you think of Indian civilization, he would say, I think that would be a good idea too. My last example comes from the memoirs of um, the writer Bisham Sani. Bisham Sani's brother, Balrat Sani, the great actor, spent some weeks in Gandhi's ashram, Sevagram, which were difficult for Bisham, uh, Balrat Sani because he was a non-vegetarian and a smoker, two activities that were forbidden in the ashram. But he wrote a letter to his brother Bisham, which recounts the openness of Gandhi's life. He says, on Gandhi's morning walks, anyone could accompany him. You could come from any part of India and ask him a question. And he would entertain it. He would answer it. But you couldn't ask him more than, more question, if, uh, more than one question. If you were extremely persistent and obstinate, at that point, writes Balrat Sani, a very tall, very dark and very smelly South Indian would come up from the back of the walking profession and come so close to you that you would recall in horror, at which point you would be pushed aside and a second questioner would come and interrogate Gandhi on his problems. So his sense of humor, like his openness, distinguishes Gandhi from politicians in his time and ours, and which is why his life, his message, his example, his personality resonate with all citizens of the globe today. Thank you.